everyone, I'm Fira from the Lawrence Hall of Science. Previously on Astrophysics Fridays, we talked about the Moon, our satellite that we are most familiar with. However, in addition to the Moon, there is yet another astronomical object that we also know very well. This one in particular can be seen during the daytime as opposed to in the nighttime. Today, let's talk about our Sun. Before we dive deeper into the Sun, we must first understand that the Sun is a star. In the very beginning, this may be very hard to grasp. It's hard to imagine that the bright blazing orb that lights up our days is the same as the tiny specks of light that we see in the night sky. But at the very core, yes, the Sun is a star. It's just that the Sun is a star that is very, very near to us while the stars that we see at night are extremely far. That is why the light of those stars are dim, while the light of the sun is very bright as seen by us on Earth. During the day, these farther stars are still there, but then the sun's rays are just so bright that they clock out the light from other stars. It was a pretty amazing feat when we came to realize that the sun is in fact just another star, and not something of its own category. You might have seen this diagram before in our previous video, but from a Hertzsprung Russell diagram containing the sun, we can tell that the sun is a G-type main sequence star. Due to this category, sometimes we say that the sun is a medium-sized star because there are stars that are much larger than the sun. But don't forget that the sun is massive. And in fact, most of the stars that we see in the night sky are actually red dwarfs that are much smaller and dimmer than the sun. Therefore, in terms of size, the sun is actually in the top 10% of all the stars in the galaxy. The sun is a giant hot ball of gas, mostly hydrogen. It extends to about 1.4 million kilometers in diameter, which is about 109 times that of the Earth. In fact, we can fit about over a million Earths inside the Sun. Essentially, the Sun is huge, and it dominates our solar system, accounting for about 99.86% of the total mass of the solar system. So we get it. The Sun is huge! But how was the Sun formed in the first place? Well, the Sun was formed around 4.6 billion years ago from the gravitational collapse of the matter within a molecular cloud. You can check out our previous video called The Early Lives of Stars for a refresher on star formation. While some of this cloud matter flattened into a disk that eventually formed the planets as well as the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt of the solar system, most of this mass gathered in the center, becoming so hot and so dense that it initiated nuclear fusion to occur in its core, forming massive amounts of energy that was enough to power the star and form the sun. The sun is around 150 million kilometers away from us. Oh, quick fun fact, this distance is also known as the astronomical unit or AU. So wow, the sun is so far away. And if that's the case, how is it possible that we can see the light from the sun and feel its heat on Earth? That's because the sun releases an enormous amount of energy. Within the sun, 600 million tons of hydrogen is converted into helium, releasing around 4 million tons of energy every second which becomes the source of the sun's powerful light and heat. This process occurs within the sun's core, where temperature and pressure is high enough for nuclear fusion to take place. Above the core is the radiative zone, where energy transfers by radiation, followed by the convective zone where energy transfers by convection. For more details on this, we covered the whole process in our video, How Stars Shine and Twinkle. Following the convective zone, we have the sun's photosphere, which is the surface of the sun that is visible to us. The photons, particles of light that are produced in the photosphere, escape the sun through the solar atmosphere, which we see as sunlight. 
Finally, we have the sun's atmosphere, which is actually composed of four layers. The chromosphere, the transition region, followed by the corona, which is extremely hot but also extremely vague, and can only be seen during a solar eclipse. The corona doesn't actually have a definite boundary, it extends even beyond the last layer of the atmosphere, the heliosphere into the solar wind. Although I mentioned earlier that the sun is a hot ball of gas, that's actually not completely accurate. Within the sun's core, the temperature is so high that electrons are stripped away from the gas atoms, creating something called plasma, which you can think of sort of like a soup of charged particles. And get this! All of that moving electric charge generates a magnetic field that varies across the surface of the sun. This brings about magnetic activity from the sun, which can be seen in the form of sunspots and solar prominences. Sunspots are visible dark patches that can be seen on the sun's photosphere. Sunspots appear when the magnetic field inhibits the convective transport of heat from the sun's interior to the surface. As a result, these areas are relatively cooler than the surrounding areas, which makes them appear darker, thus resulting in sunspots. On the other hand, solar prominences are large gaseous features that extend from the sun's surface all the way to the corona. Prominences happen when the plasma that flows along the magnetic field structures of the sun become unstable and burst, releasing the plasma into these red glowing loops. A prominence may persist in the corona for several weeks and loops for hundreds of thousands of miles into space. The sun's magnetic field also leads to many effects known as the solar activity, one of which is solar flares. Flares are gigantic and explosive bursts of energy, ejecting plasma and particles into space. Compared to prominences, flares are much bigger, but they're also a lot more sudden, lasting only several minutes. Often, but not always, flares and prominences are followed by coronal mass ejection, or CME, which is another form of solar activity. CMEs release large ejections of materials and electromagnetic radiation, which could reach as far as to the planetary systems and even beyond. Oh wow, I don't know about you, but seeing all of these explosive phenomena from the sun makes me a little bit scared. I mean, what if this ejection of materials reach the Earth? Thankfully for us, we are relatively well protected. Our atmosphere absorbs the high-energy light, and the Earth's magnetic field deflects most of the charged particles. But sometimes when these charged particles interact with our magnetic fields just right, these particles are funneled to the Earth's magnetic poles, causing the air to glow and form auroras, also known as the northern or southern lights. Unfortunately, it's not always peaceful. Sometimes these interactions can produce strong currents of electricity in the Earth's crust, which affects power grids and causes blackouts. In 1859, the first and most powerful solar storm was detected. If such a storm were to happen in our direction today, we would have a worldwide blackout which could affect our civilization very, very badly. This is why it's important for us to study the sun, because as much as it gives us light, warmth, and even helps sustain life, it is also fully capable of ruining our society as we know it. So we must dedicate our time to understand it fully, because our future depends on it. And with that, we've reached the end of our video today. I hope you had fun learning about the sun, its compositions, and its various activities. Be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to our channel, and keep asking big questions about the universe. I'll see you next time. Bye!